Hello, history friends, and welcome to Cabinet of Curiosity, where today we're going to investigate some very pressing questions. This is a sad iron. This is also a sad iron. This iron? Sad. But why? Are they disappointed? Homesick? Bereft? Do they grieve the inherent meaninglessness of existence? Or do they just listen to the Smiths a lot? The word sad originally comes from the Old English, where it meant something that was heavy, solid, or weighty. Eventually, the word evolved, as words tend to do, and it came to be applied to people, specifically people who were weighed down with negative emotion, heavy with sorrow. The original word was eventually forgotten, except when it came to apply to irons for some reason. These irons come from the late 19th and early 20th centuries, when a laundry was a lot more, um, involved than it is today. And by involved, I mean back-breaking freaking drudgery. Everyone who's ever worn cloth on their body has needed to clean that cloth eventually, and it has always been hard work. But the advent of the 19th century and modernity ironically made laundry kind of worse. Here's why. In the olden times of yore, for most ordinary people, doing laundry meant somebody taking your clothes down to the river a few times a year, soaking it in fermented urine and ashes, and hitting it with a big stick. Which sucked, but at least you didn't have to do it very often. With the advent of the 19th century, however, the general population suddenly had more clothes, higher hygiene standards, and cheaper soap, which meant that to be respectable, you were expected to do laundry much more often and were more likely to be judged on the whiteness and starchiness of your fabric body coverings. By the mid-19th century, doing an average family's laundry took at least two days every week. And not an eight-hour day with two 15-minute breaks and half-hour for lunch. We're talking 12, 14, maybe 16 hours of hauling water, soaking, scrubbing, wringing, dollying, wringing, rinsing, wringing again, bluing, starching, and of course, yet more wringing. Not only that, but remember, all the water that you're using usually has to be hauled in or pumped by hand, and then heated on a coal or wood stove, which means you have to haul in the water, heat it on the stove, then you have to haul in more water, then you have to heat that on the stove, then you have to haul in more fuel to heat the water on the stove, etc, 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 etc. Meanwhile, for rich people, not washing could be a sign of status. From the early modern period all the way to the 19th century, the very rich sometimes bragged about only washing their clothes once or twice a year. Not because they wore dirty clothes, but because they had so many clothes, they could wear something clean every day for months and months at a time before having to send their giant heap of dirty underwear away for washing. But we're not talking about them. Once our ordinary housewife or laundress had finally managed to get all the wet stuff over with, she was ready to hang it all out. Provided it wasn't raining, or snowing, or if you lived in Michelle or Coal Creek, so windy that the coal dust got all over everything and you had to wash it all over again. By ferny times, there were gasoline-powered or electric washing machines available, but if you wanted such luxury, you had better start saving your pennies because they were not cheap. By 1913, an electric washing machine with a ringer cost about $70, which for your average ferny coal miner was over a month's wages. So you can see here that we have two types of iron. These two are from the mid to late 19th century, and they're a true sad iron, which means they're basically just a chunk of metal with a point at one end and a handle attached to the top. And then this one is also sort of a sad iron, but it's a fancier version that arrives at the end of the 19th, early 20th centuries, and we're going to get into the differences a little bit later. You may be wondering how you would actually use one of these on a stove. Well, let's find out. So how do you heat up an iron? Well, I've got my iron here, and I've got my nice hot wood stove right behind me. Of course, if I was a real Victorian, I would not be using the wood stove that came up to just above my knees, but I can't just take this and start flinging it onto the stove willy-nilly. First, I have to make sure that the ironing surface is perfectly clean and smooth, because anything that's on the surface is going to get onto my clothes. So what I would do is I would sand it down, usually with something like salt or ashes or ground up brick dust to make sure that everything was off, then I can put it onto the stove. 
So I'm going to put my irons on the stove and I'm going to time how long it takes for them to heat up. Average electric iron takes approximately two minutes. I've got my trusty stopwatch and away we go. How hot does it need to be and how do I know when it's hot enough? Well, if I was a proper Victorian housewife, which I emphatically am not, I would be able to hold the iron up against my face or maybe my hand and I would be able to tell exactly how hot it needed to be for the type of fabric that I was ironing. But because I don't know what I'm doing, we're just going to do the spit test and try to figure it out that way. You'll no notice here that I have my ironing pad, also known as a pot holder, to protect my hand. So I'm not just grabbing anything off the stove. Uh. Now if you remember, way back at the beginning of this video, we had three sad irons. And I told you that this one, in particular, was special. We're not going to be heating it up because it happens to be a real museum artifact, and I'm pretty sure that putting it onto a hot wood stove is against museum policy. While we're waiting for our irons to heat up, why don't we go and find out more about this? This piece of high-tech, cutting-edge technology was invented by a woman named Mary Florence Potts in around 1869 and was forever after known as the Mrs. Potts Iron. It has three major improvements on the sad iron. Number one, it's not solid metal. It's actually a metal outer shell and the inside is filled with cement, which doesn't radiate heat upward as much onto your vulnerable hand bits. Number two! It's pointed on both ends, so you can iron your clothes backwards and forwards. Number three, and this is the really clever bit, it has a wooden detachable handle. So you can leave the base on the stove heating up, and you can remove the handle and take it with you, attaching it to another base, instead of leaving it sitting on the stove like the other ones, building up enough heat to burn your hand right off. Okay. So it has been approximately 3 minutes and 15 seconds. And according to the spitometer, these irons are super hot. Remember, an electric iron takes about 2 minutes to heat up. These take approximately 3, so there's not that much difference in timing. However, I will say that one of the nice things about an electric iron is that you don't have to stand within arm's reach of a roaring wood stove to use it. The entire left side of my body is sweating right now. My earlobes are sweating. Everything, everything is sweating. So we're ready to go. I've got my laundry here. It's a linen dish towel, which I wetted last night and then wrung out and screwed it into a ball and which is going to be super wrinkly. I don't know if you can see the wrinkles on this. Ooh. If you look very closely, you might notice that this is also an older dish towel. <laughs> That's because I didn't want to use any of our good ones in case I singed them with a hundred year old iron. Now this fabric is still slightly damp. If I wanted it to be a little bit damper, I would use something called a sprinkler bottle, which would be a just an ordinary glass bottle with a little cork attachment in the top of it like this. You can see little tiny holes. And uh, you would just shake it over your laundry, kind of like a salt shaker or a pepper shaker. If you didn't have a sprinkler bottle and you wanted to do things the old-fashioned way, you could always just take a mouthful of water and spit it onto your laundry. Like this. I think there's a trick to it. Now that my laundry is nice and uh, <clears throat> moistened, we can start ironing. Okay. Ready? Ooh, look at the steam coming off of it. You hear it sizzling? So you would never iron with just one iron at a time. Irons were usually sold in sets of three. And that was because ironing was a relay. As I use this iron, it's going to start to lose its heat. And when it does, I have to be able to switch it out for another iron that's been heating on the stove. Otherwise, if I have to put it back on the stove and wait for it to heat up, the ironing is going to take forever. 
In case you were wondering, these things are also very, very heavy. This weighs about six pounds. And in order to move it across the surface of the fabric, I, I have to hold it up a little bit. And some of these irons got up to 10 pounds. So you can imagine how much effort that would take shifting irons around all day just to get the wrinkles out of your clothes. I mean, who needs the gym, right? While you're using them, you had to constantly wipe them down to make sure that the wood stove didn't leave any soot or stove blacking on the surface because, as I mentioned before, anything that was on the surface of the iron got onto your clothes. You could ruin a perfectly washed linen shirt by putting a sooty iron onto it. I don't know if you can see it, but my tea towel is now slightly smoother than it was before, which I consider a victory. It's also slightly singed. Good thing I used an old one. You can imagine how ecstatic everybody was when this showed up. There were other irons patented earlier in the 19th century that ran on all sorts of stuff. Gasoline, kerosene, denatured alcohol, even electricity. There were electric irons patented in the 1880s, but they didn't really take off until the hot point iron was introduced in 1905. And yes, I mean, electric irons at the time were a little bit heavier and they were kind of awkward and yeah, you did have to plug them into the light socket, but compared to this, they were a miracle. I mean, look at this thing. It's light, it's clean, it stays hot. You don't have to stand next to a raging wood stove in the middle of summer for an entire day. This thing is amazing! By the 1920s, most homes had a regular and reliable source of electricity, and the electric iron became ubiquitous. In fact, if you only managed to have two newfangled electric appliances in your house, they were usually a radio and an electric iron. It took a while, but eventually the average household had access to an electric washing machine as well. All of this amazing technology meant that suddenly women had time. They could take all the countless hours that they had previously devoted just to laundry and they could read a book or go outside and talk to their friends or interact with their family or they could do literally anything other than just washing, drying, and ironing clothes. Which was huge! It's not an exaggeration to say that when it comes to women's emancipation, things like this and the washing machine are right up there with birth control, the right to work, and the vote. And that's a piece of history that should never be washed away. Thank you for watching Cabinet of Curiosity, and please tune in next week when we peer into the politics of peeing in public.